So usually when I talk about safety and health on the lathe, I start my induction videos with um, the difference between being scary and being dangerous. There are lots of tools here in the metal shop that are um, scary and dangerous at both times. Um, and most of the tools like angle grinders would try to warn you. They are loud, they're trying to escape uh, your hands, they are vibrating and you have that gut instinct that that thing maybe not to mess with. But with the lace it's kind of a silent machine that I've turned it on and it does pretty much nothing. And people tend to dismiss this type of threats, but that machine is dangerous. That machine is uh, actually uh, going to kill you if you do something wrong. And it usually takes several seconds uh, for the unfolding accident to happen, uh, in which time you should uh, hit emergency stop buttons. Uh, so my first advice here would be uh, don't uh, treat it lightly. Uh, try to treat it like a, a drunk driving of sorts um, or driving in general. Don't uh, do anything on the lathe under any influence of uh, drugs or alcohol. Uh, be sharp, be consciousness, uh, get enough sleep. Uh, if you're drowsy, if you feel that you're um, sleeping on uh, certain things, just put it off until another day. Um, because we're not here churning on mass manufacturing. We're trying to do some sort of like recreational hobby stuff and there will be always another day. You're not getting paid for that. Uh, it's no, there's no point endangering yourself. Um, so, there are three main risks, um, I mean, I encourage you to read the uh, risk assessment list, um, in fact, do it if you want to uh, pass the quiz, uh, but if I want something uh, to be uh, left in your brain after this video, um, there are three main dangers here with the lace as with the most spinning machines in the metal shop. And uh, they are entanglement, projectiles and burns. So first things first, entanglement. That's the thing that kills here. Um, everything that can be uh, trapped and spin around in the chuck uh, will be at some point. So your rules are no long sleeves, uh, no rings, no watches, long hair must be tied back. Uh, sometimes you have clothing like hoodies with the strings, all that kind of sorts. If you're leaning on the machine it can be trapped in the chuck. Basically when things get trapped in the chuck uh, it spins things in and you head your head, head on it. Uh, which is not very healthy and can be fatal. Uh, fortunately, that's not the most common source of accidents on the lathe. Uh, the most common source of accident I accidents is actually projectiles. So everything that loads in this chuck uh, and spinning would be sent flying eventually. Um, so the general idea of your machining, well, you don't stand in the plane of the uh, chuck spinning. You always close the guard. Uh, what you usually do, you stand from the side, um, lo looking from the side. Um, the main reason of things flying is uh, when you have a chuck key, and you have it left here, uh, and you forget about it. This one uh, has a spring specifically for it. We do have a chuck key without a spring, which has slightly more lever. You won't be able to close the guard here. Still, um, the good part of 
working with the lace is forming good habits. And one of them is called key discipline. Uh, you don't leave the chuck in the uh, you don't leave the key in the chuck. Uh, you always put that key into one single place. We have a magnet over there where we store uh, every uh, keys uh, for the chuck. Uh, but you don't have to. It just uh, have to be one place. It could be in your pocket. It can be on the table. It can be in your apron. Uh, it doesn't matter as soon as it's the same place all the time. You form that habit. You never leave it there. And the third main risk is uh, burns. Uh, burns are not specifically dangerous as such, but basically when you cut metal, metal gets hot. Um, it shouldn't get hot on the lace. If you, it gets hot, you're doing something right, because if the metal gets hot, you're losing precision. Uh, but still, it sometimes does. And the problem here is when you touch hot surfaces, uh, you have a jerk reaction and you hit yourself on other part of the uh, machine that are protruding and can be sharp. When working on the lathe, use protective glasses. Uh, you can use your regular glasses or uh, the one we have in the metal shop here. Uh, usually it's quite a low risk of uh, some stuff like chips and swore flying when the uh, guard is on. Uh, however, I would insist that the um, However low, uh, low that risk is, it's not worth uh, losing your eye. Our risk assessment has a nice and extensive list of things not to do. And some of them are more obvious than other. Uh, for example, it says that you shouldn't uh, clean the lathe while it's on. And I would extend that rule that that machine should be uh, preferably double insulated. Uh, when you're trying to do any sort of maintenance with it uh, or mm, you're not working with it actively. So when you clean the lathe or uh, you're changing tools, you're changing settings, uh, I mean if you're just changing tools you can just uh, stop the machine. Uh, but if you're trying to reach something from behind, if you're trying to change the gears, uh, if you're trying to ch uh, do something uh, long and extensive, uh, where you can potentially lean on some on-off switch, I would uh, encourage you to switch it off completely. Uh, we have a guard here, which has a, um, a limit switch that switches the machine on. So that would be one. Uh, point of your safety. The second one, you switch the machine off from power or you hit an emergency stop, uh, you switch it here, uh, you switch it from the uh, wall socket. Here in the space we have a no working alone rule. Uh, basically you're not allowed to work uh, on any heavy machinery when you're a single person in the arches. I would encourage you to apply this specifically to this arch we're in because uh, no one would hear you if you have an accident on the lathe uh, while uh, no one is in uh, this arch and there's someone in another. And I mean, should I say that it's, it's kind of hard to call 999 with one limb? Don't ever use gloves on the lathe or around metal shop in general uh, when dealing with spinning machines. Uh, if you need to deal with uh, chemicals, put the uh, single-use gloves on and then uh, uh, remove them. If you uh, don't want to touch the oily substances on the lathe, there are some protective uh, berry creams that you can use instead. So, when you're working with the stock uh, on the lathe, the general rule for stick out it shouldn't be more than uh, roughly four times the uh, diameter of the stock. If it's longer, uh, it would be spinning around. In fact, um, it's kind of dangerous, but you won't be able to machine anything anyways. Uh, so you would need a, a support from the back. So use a tail stock for that.
if you're using uh, sandpaper on the lathe, which would I would advise against if you're an experienced user of the machine. Um, I mean, you can always take parts after you finish them out of the lathe and stick it into the drill chuck or some sort of more uh, controllable environment. But if you are using uh, sandpaper on the lathe, you should use the uh, sandpaper holder we have here. Uh, and the sandpaper should be uh, the cl uh, should not be the close based. It should be paper based, so it breaks easily. Uh, generally, everything you try to stick into the uh, check zone underneath the guard area when the machine is operating should be easily breakable. For example, uh, those brushes are safe to use, uh, but something like uh, metal bits uh, wouldn't be. When using sandpaper on the lathe, uh, remember that sandpaper generates a lot of abrasive particles that damage the precision surfaces of the machine. Uh, so you, when you're using sandpaper on the lathe, you're expected to cover uh, the lathe and the waste uh, with some sort of material. It has to be non-close material, it has to be paper. There's a certain Mm, misunderstanding about our, if we are allowed to use files on the lathe. That's also an advanced thing uh, to do. Technically, um, files are made from really hard and brittle metal and they are expected to shatter if something goes wrong. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on it and not like no fly. Uh, basically file not getting like trapped into the chuck and fly away uh, so avoid it if you can you can stop the machine and file things manually when uh, you're working close to the chuck uh, be extra careful when you're working close to the chuck because it's really easy uh, to hit your tool with one of the jaws in fact, before starting the machine, uh, when you're working close to the chuck, make sure that the tool is clear of the jaws and nothing is hitting. Um, unfortunately, you have to work close to the chuck because uh, this point here is the most rigid point of the machine. So you have to learn how to deal with it. When you're using autofeed, prepare to disengage it and keep your hand on it at all times when it's working. So basically when uh, you're closer to the end where you're machining, you hit it instantaneously. Try to do the safety approach here like um, people do in aviation. Uh, usually they have a set of checklists and a second pilot controlling it. Um, you probably won't have a second pilot, but for your first uh, couple of uh, times you're working with the machine, uh, you can get your friend uh, or someone uh, standing next to you and controlling what you're doing. Give them a set of checklists uh, to follow and uh, try to control that yourself. Stopping the machine. They we have a set of emergency stops. Um, the guard here is interlocked. When you uh, lift it up, machine stops. We have a emergency stop here, which is lockable. When you hit it, it will stop the machine. Uh, power lever would obviously stop the machine. Uh, but when you press it down, uh, there's a manual brake that stops the motor from spinning. And we have a, a foot pedal on the floor uh, for stopping machine with your feet. This machine has uh, quite a few uh, moving parts. Uh, the lid screw is usually rotating and the auto feed uh, screw is usually rotating. Uh, don't um, put anything in there, don't lean on it. Uh, in fact, don't put anything on top of the machine that can fall down into the moving parts. Um, that's not a coffee cup holder. Um, if you have long stock, which is sticking out 
of the uh, it goes to the, to the chuck and the whole machine um, and would be sticking out and rotating here you're supposed to uh, close the area for uh, people passing by metal shop machines are generally designed to cut through no matter what and stay at constant rpm at all times this one is uh, specifically uh, good or bad at it um, the whole idea of the lace as a machine is to maintain the constant rotational speed so it wouldn't stop no matter what you put into the thing uh, keep that in mind the mass underneath the uh, cover here is uh, quite sufficient to probably spin you around uh, the machine um, we are talking about tens of kilograms of rotating uh, gears over there um, so it has enough power to do pretty much anything uh, and that's a small machine the larger machines can literally uh, spin around humans on the uh, check. Don't uh, treat it lightly. In order for machine to be started, you should be signed in, uh, signed in into the tool control and the machine should be powered on. Uh, then you have to make sure that the guard is closed. Uh, your e-stop is undone and then uh, and the, your start lever in the first position and then you can turn the machine on press the start button and the light should turn on the green red light is supposed to indicate that the machine is on but not operated and then you can start the machine it will start spinning in order to shut down the machine you press the lever, you can manually stop it uh, and you press the off button uh, it's a good idea to put it on the emergency stop as well and then sign out of the tool control parts of the lathe and let's work on the assumption that if I don't uh, tell you how it's called you won't need it in the near future uh, so generally that's a headstock uh, that's a straight choke that's a tailstock, uh, that's a guard, that's a chuck. Uh, that carriage here is usually called main slide. Uh, this is one is cross slide. And uh, I've seen different names for this one, uh, but I would call it a uh, compound slide. And this is a tool called holder with the inter like there's a tool post with the interchangeable tool holder. and it's removable that's a quick change tool holder uh, it's designed to be repeatable so each time you put the tool back it's in exactly the same position as it was before uh, right so that's the main switch uh, that's the reverse for the machine I'll tell you how to operate reverse later on uh, that's the gearbox we have three levers there it's like a car gearbox but um, there are three levers instead of one and each of them can have only one position it's either left or right we have a table here um, which says which um, speed it would be uh, when you set layers into the exact position um, it's a manual gearbox so you have like actual gears inside the machine make sure they're clicking in this lever over here it's the auto feed and the uh, lead screw uh, direction switch um, one of them is uh, forward one of them is reverse and when it's in the middle it's in, it is engaged uh, that's the lead screw I uh, used to cut uh, threads on the machine that's the auto feed that uh, moves the carriages automatically uh, right uh, that thing here 
is the uh, coolant tap, we call it, uh, which is operated by the coolant pump, which you can uh, turn on on the panel. And coolant may be in one of three modes. It can be switched off, it can be switched on constantly, or it can be switched on when the machine is uh, on. Take tailstock here has a, a locking lever. In this position, it's locked and it would move anywhere. In this position, it's unlocked and you can slide it uh, left and right. It won't slide out because uh, of the uh, limit here. This lever here uh, stops it um, from rotating. Uh, so it's locked in position and it's more uh, rigid. It, you put stuff in there. Um, it has a Morse taper um, inside the thing. It's basically like a conical surface. Uh, you have a corresponding Morse taper 3 uh, corresponding Morse taper 3 uh, surface in here. You rotate it so the uh, part sticking out here is horizontal. You uh, spin the um, his stock handle until you see the scale on the cool and then you just slide it there it's held by friction uh, and it wouldn't go anywhere if you just uh, gently check it in uh, in order to remove it uh, you move it back past the zero on the scale and at some point you'll feel the resistors uh, that's the ejector pin uh, which uh, ejects the uh, thing you have here out of the quill. So here on the carriage we have carriage lock. When it's locked you won't be able to move the main flag left and right. When it's unlocked it's movable. Uh, also here we have the uh, auto feed um, direction. When it's out there will be uh, auto feed of the main slide, it will be moving left and right. When it's in, uh, the auto feed would move the uh, cross carriage instead. Uh, that's the auto feed lever. Uh, that's the auto feed lever here. Um, it's like a, uh, yep. Uh, so the auto fit lever wouldn't engage when you have a uh, cross slide uh, mode here. But if I do go to the main slide, uh, I can engage the auto fit and mm -hmm. engage the auto fit. Over there we have a cooling drain where the cooling goes uh, and it goes into the tank underneath. Uh, which has a coolant pump that gets it back into the uh, tap. Oh. The tap here is adjustable. Yeah, we can see it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the actual flow regulator for the tap. So the real, uh, the main carriage sliding all uh, on is called waste. Uh, it's a precisely machined surface uh, designed to be exactly parallel to the uh, chuck axis uh, keep it clean at all times. So in the control panel here uh, we have a start and stop button. Um, when the machine is on the light uh, turns from uh, green to red and back, which means that machine is not operating. If we turn it on, it will stay day. Uh, there's a coolant pump here. If we turn it on, there's a coolant pump uh, switch here. If we turn it on, the coolant would turn on. Um, that um, switch here is the uh, reverse. By default that machine is wired so it won't go to reverse until you explicitly enable it here. So the reverse switch on the main switch does nothing. The chuck would rotate the same direction no matter what. 
uh, the chuck should be uh, always rotating towards you when you're cutting things. Um, if you hold that thing for a few seconds, it would go into the reverse mode um, and it will stay in the reverse mode and now reverse switch is operational. So the chuck was, will rotate uh, depending on the uh, reverse switch position here. In order to stop it, just restart the machine. If you just flick it uh, shortly, nothing would happen. Before we start machining, I want to uh, talk about theory and we will need to learn about three main things. The first one being that um, metal is not what you think it is. Generally people imagine metals are as something uh, hard and sturdy, something like a hammer you bang a nail with, but uh, when you're Mm, delving into the speeds and pressures uh, we're working uh, on the lathe, it kind of changes its properties. I, I'm usually comparing it with airplanes. When they are standing on the ground, uh, they're just like sitting there in the air and the air flows freely around it. But when they are in the sky and moving at 800 kilometers per hour, uh, they are sort of swimming through the air like a liquid and air is able to support that. So with the uh, rotating um, stock in the lathe and the cutter relative to it, um, we are getting to a, some sort of certain phase shift of sorts uh, where your metal, instead of being hard, behaves like a clay or play-doh. Uh, what you're doing on the lathe, you're not cutting metal. Um, you're doing the cut and shear deformation at the same time. And it's due to the um, way of metal is structured within itself. Because basically all metals uh, have a um, what they have inside is a crystallic structure. So you have uh, crystals uh, separated by some sort of like amorphous bodies type of thing. And when you're machining it, you're ripping out the crystals because the metal breaks at the uh, amorphous bit. And when you apply cutter to the material, it shears and cuts at the same time um, when it's being removed. Uh, and there are certain ways of dealing with that crystallic structure. Different metals have uh, larger crystals or smaller crystals. When the crystals are large, um, the metal is harder and more brittle. Um, generally for steel um, and actually for other metals, uh, you can actually harden aluminium, for example. It's just less useful. Uh, for steel, uh, you harden it by heating it up around 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, steel loses its magnetic properties and the crystals dissolve and it becomes fully amorphous and brittle. Uh, and when you cool it down, you're forming, forming new crystals in the, inside the material. And if you cool it down rapidly, the crystals would be large. And if you could cool it down slowly, the crystals would be small. So you would have um, softer or stronger material bit. But what you have to remember when you heat it up up to a certain point, uh, it basically loses the crystallic structure and uh, becomes really uh, brittle and behaving not like a metal type of thing. The second thing I want to talk about here is um, mm, geometrical uh, things that I like to call magical geometrical pro properties. And my best example here is uh, one of the invention inventions that led to the Industrial Revolution. And surprisingly, that's not lathe. Uh, I'm talking about lapping plates. So it turns out if you have um, two plates of metal and you rub them against each other, uh, the 
one plate would copy, copy the uh, protruding parts from another plate and you're kind of imprinting the uh, defects on one plate into the another one but you have if you have three of them and you're taking two and driving them together and then you're taking two and driving them together and another two and driving them together eventually all the defects of the surface would zero out and you end up with a really really smooth surface we're talking uh, nanometer level here uh, it, and just because of general geometry and some sort of like statistical properties so the lathe is a machine here has that um, geometrical properties it um, always cuts perfect circles so no matter what you do no matter what you stick in the check how uneven square it is uh, the way the idea that uh, that machine rotates um, leads to uh, exactly perfect circular removal of material but usually people think that lace cuts sort of cylindrical surfaces and that can be further from truth uh, basically when you move uh, the carriage uh, on the lathe it moves horizontally but at the same time that ways over here they're not exactly parallel to the axis of the check rotation so you are either getting closer to the uh, stock that's rotating in the chuck or getting farther away so it would be a conical surface and if you are cutting it perpendicular it would be also a con conical surface so, uh, lathe always cuts tapers no matter what you do this lathe would cut tapers um, and it would be sloped one way or another the way it doesn't and it kind of cuts something that looks like cylindrical surfaces it's only because of the uh, way machine is set up the ways are precisely machined at the factory and are set up to be as parallel to the uh, check uh, rotating axis as possible and that what um, makes you do any sort of like precise cylinders but when you're dealing with the machine keep in mind that the uh, cross slide is set up to be always perpendicular main slide is set up to be always horizontal to the stock but the compound is designed to cut tapers and basically it cuts whatever the previous person has left uh, it in position to cut and you certainly can make it uh, do some sort of cylindrical parallel surfaces uh, but it would take a long time to adjust so when you're cutting cylinders please use main slide and the cross slide and the third main point I want uh, to talk uh, here in this theoretical part is rigidity you may think of metals and that machine is like a huge chunk of metal that weighs half a ton um, as being sort of rigid uh, but when you're applying a kilowatt of rotating power into the thing it becomes a big spring everything is springy here uh, you can imagine it like it's an old Disney cartoons when the uh, characters are swinging on their feet constantly. That machine is designed to swing. Uh, the chuck axis has some sort of resonances. It moves up and down. Your tool moves up and down. Uh, the whole thing jumps a little bit. And when it's cutting, it uh, moves up and down on the surface and creates a sort of like sine wave on it. And you want, want to avoid that resonant, uh, resonance as, as much as possible. That's why the machine is heavy. That my, uh, that, uh, that's why the machine is rigid. And that's why you want to all the things here to be as tight as possible. Uh, when you don't want the main carriage to slide, use the lock to lock it. Uh, when you're working 
on something that requires the rigidity, get the machine as close to the chuck as possible. That's the sturdiest point. Tool sticking out uh, should be as short as possible uh, for the job you make. You want to make um, to work as close to the solid chunk of metal here uh, as possible uh, in your uh, scenario. Uh, same goes for the tailstock. You can let's design a simple lathe cutter. So lathe is a single point cutting tool. I'll try to explain why. For example, if we look at that thing here, uh, let's imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's imagine how it would uh, cut the surface here. You have a stock that's rotating and you have the cutter that's moving left and you have that uh, curve here and it creates a track in the metal which would be uh, a spiral shaped track. And basically if he, we just leave it like that it would copy all the imperfections from that cutter uh, into the chunk we are dealing with and create multiple grooves in it. So if we just leave it like that, we won't be able to uh, machine the surface precisely because we would be constantly referencing uh, the tool on a different point. Um, so we wouldn't know how long it is if it's touching the stock or not. That's why, uh, in order to be precise, lace is a single point cutter. So your usual uh, cutting tool uh, looks like this. And let's talk that through. For example, if we just take a needle, it would be a single point, uh, point cutter as well. So if we just do something like really long and thin uh, with a single point on the end. It would work nicely, but unfortunately that wouldn't be rigid. So it would resonate um, and it would bend and it would wear out quickly and we would quickly lose precision. So we want that... Uh, uh, we want that uh, tool to be uh, shorter and more rigid and more precise and we end up with something uh, like this. Uh, but when we are doing this we won't be able to get uh, closer to the uh, machining, to the surface of, of the machining. Imagine we are machining uh, some sort of the shoulder over here and when we uh, got close to the shoulder the left part here would be rubbing this shoulder. So we want to move that cutter at angle. So that's why we have the basic uh, cutters having that single point of cut on the left uh, instead of uh, on the middle or on the right if you prefer to cut the uh, right shoulders. Um, in terms of clearance, uh, this uh, clearance angle here is around 10 degrees for steel and it provides enough uh, surface uh, to clear for, um, for to clear this work out uh, but still keeps the rigidity. Same goes for the angle over here. Same goes for the angle over here. We have the round stock rotating so we ha should have the clearance angle uh, from that circle and that's around another 10 degrees. That's how we come with the uh, basic uh, lace cutter. Uh, there's another angle here. That's basically how sharp, how sharp we want it to be uh, relative to the uh, material being cut. That angle is called rake, rake angle and it depends on the material we are cutting. For steel, uh, your usual rake angle is around 8 to 15 degrees. Positive rake, rake angles usually means that it goes up like that. Uh, positive rake angles provide cleaner surfaces uh, but uh, would wear out the tool quicker. If you do rough cutting, you can uh, go with zero rake angle or negative uh, rake, rake angle. Um, your tool would live longer. 
different materials uh, have different rate angles. It's uh, a book uh, reference value. Um, generally, the softer the metal is, the more the rake angle is. So, for example, as I, if I remember correctly, the recommended rake angle for aluminium is around 35 degrees up. But pretty much in no circumstances you would encounter a special tool designed to cut aluminium um, because it's very specific and uh, softer material have a better surface finish uh, by definition. So no one does that. So that's your rake angles on the general uh, cutting tools. This is HSS cutting tool, by the way. It's high speed steel. Uh, it's um, a special alloy that's designed to be hard and then it's uh, hardened by heat and tempered. Um, the good thing about it, it's really easy to sharpen. Uh, you can just sharpen it on the bench grinder, soaking it in water so it wouldn't overheat. Um, another good thing about it, it's bendy. So instead of uh, Basically, when you're doing interrupted cuts, imagine we have, we're cutting like a square surface or something, and we're hitting uh, the uh, tip of the metal repeatedly. Instead of uh, breaking, it would deflect, it would bend and deflect, uh, which is a good thing in certain circumstances. Uh, the bad thing about it is basically that deflection uh, could lose your precision if you push it too hard. Also, if you remove um, a thick layer of material, uh, HSS would heat up, like as any other cutter would heat up, and around 600 degrees for steel, it uh, uh, would lose its uh, hardened properties and would shatter apart. You can usually uh, see the uh, temperatures uh, cycling through steel when you heat it up by the uh, color of oxide layer. You can look it up on Wikipedia, but generally it goes from yellowish to uh, bluish colors, and then it becomes black, and when it be then becomes red hot and uh, uh, breaks away. In order to deal with the heat, uh, they are carbide cutters. They usually come in uh, two different uh, shapes or forms. You either have a carbide uh, plate uh, braced on top of the uh, steel holder or you can have interchangeable chunks um, which can be removed uh, and changed using a key. So we're talking here about tungsten carbide which is a really strong material. It can withstand uh, down the heat up to several thousand degrees. Um, it's not that you should do that on the lathe because when metals heat up where they deform and you lose precision anyways. Uh, but it's hard and um, you can push it way harder than your HSS tools. Uh, the downside of it, it's industrially manufactured. Um, so when it breaks, you have to replace the uh, interchangeable chunk. And unfortunately, there's no such thing as a monocrystallic tungsten carbide. So what you see here, it's not the huge crystal of tungsten tungsten carbide, it's a, a sintered powder, usually sintered with nickel. So that thing is, uh, despite it being harder, it's uh, way more brittle. So if you're doing interrupted cuts and your uh, stock repeatedly uh, hitting the thing, you probably would be better off with the uh, HSS tools. Also, if you need some sort of custom uh, shaped forming tools, uh, you can grind them uh, from HSS. Otherwise, we would uh, usually use uh, this uh, universal cutter. This one is just a grooving cutter that makes a triangular groove in your stock. But some of those cutters, especially if you find them to be skewed like that and um, have 60 degrees over here, are designed to cut threads. And the way it's off-center, it's um, Mm, there because you want to get as close to the shoulder your cut, uh, cutting thread on uh, as possible. 
The lathe is not necessarily always a single point cutter. There, uh, there's a such thing as a forming tools. You won't get any precise surface uh, like that, but you can create chamfers. Uh, you can create smoother surface. Uh, remember, I talked about um, lace cutters doing uh, spirals on the stock. If you have the wider point of cut, uh, it would allow to smear it out and smooth out your surface, but you would lose precision uh, if you're uh, doing that. But you would uh, create the glossier finish. Also, there's a special uh, sorts of tools that are um, either a parting tool or grooving tool that uh, can create square grooves or remove the, um, your, uh, the tool you're making from the uh, stock. Metals can have some unexpected properties uh, when you deal with them. For example, you may not know, but aluminium is sticky. When you squish it together, it sticks on itself. It tends to stick to your tools. And because we usually don't have specific cutting tools for aluminium, it quickly becomes an issue. Uh, you deal it with it uh, with adding more oil into it, but sometimes you just uh, have to live with it. For example, we wouldn't have like all the drills. Uh, we have a metal shop are designed to deal with steel. So when you're drilling aluminium, uh, the angles on the uh, drill itself wouldn't be proper for aluminium and your uh, aluminium chunk you're drilling through would try to suck that uh, drill in. You just have to keep it in mind. The important thing to remember uh, when working on the lathe is every time you move your stock uh, in the chuck you lose concentricity. Imagine you cut some sort of like circular thing in here and then you think maybe I should move it a little bit out. The problem here is when you stick it uh, inside and tighten it and it should be obviously as tight as possible so it won't fly away, uh, you dent the surface of your stock and dent it in a different uh, way so your circle wouldn't become a circle it would be slightly off the axis of rotation and this thing is unavoidable so there are a couple of ideas how to deal with it the first idea is you don't ever remove your stock from the chuck until your part is finished the second one mm, technically if you're turning stuff between centers uh, usually that setup is way more repeatable if you just uh, hold that thing in, in the chuck itself. The third thing, um, I have a, an alignment tool here. Um, basically, you stick that in. Uh, you don't uh, tighten the chuck fully. You just do it hand tight, but not uh, applying the force here you're setting the lace to a slow speed. That thing has a bearing in here. And if you push it into your stock, it would realign it in the chuck uh, so it would be more concentric. But your precision with that thing would be low, despite that thing uh, being a Nabic 9 uh, bearing. Your precision would be around five or 10 thou off. Uh, so the good way of dealing with it, here we have a three jaw chuck. Um, the three jaw chuck is amazing uh, because you have all the jaws moving at the same time. It's quick, it's mostly self-centering. Um, it would be way off, but uh, it still centers your part uh, good enough to be machined on the lathe. Uh, but specifically for realigning the part, there are uh, four jaw chucks where you can move every jaw independently. So you can undo the thing. We have a chuck key over here. We remove the chuck. We put on the four jaw chuck. 
then we stick our stock into the forger chuck and align it horizontally and then align it vertically referencing with a dial indicator it's not a very quick process and I won't show it here um, but it's definitely within the realm of possible the jaws on this chuck is what it's called internal jaws they are designed to hold the uh, smaller diameter stock uh, but technically uh, if you have something large machine uh, and I'm speaking that large uh, you can change the jaws on the chuck uh, to external ones external ones would look like that um, so they would fit into the chuck the opposite direction so the like the grooved part would be on inside rather than outside um, and in order to do that on a three jaw chuck you just undo them fully so now the jaws can be removed and you can stick them other way around um, the way that it works uh, the jaws on the chuck have numbers this is number one uh, there's number two and number three you stick that back in and uh, then you rotate the key roughly half a turn until it grabs then you stick number two back in you rotate the key and so on uh, the chuck has this in like an Archimedes spiral inside, uh, inside of it that would uh, grab number one and number two and number three sequentially and the way to tell if you've done it properly you close the chuck uh, back and if they uh, go into the same point uh, they're correct So they should fully close at one point. Remember I told uh, you that you have to use certain speeds for different metals? Um, let's talk a bit about how it's uh, done. Basically when you have something rotating in the chuck, you have a um, cutter going on top of the uh, circle with a certain speed that depends on the radius of the circle. The bigger it gets, the faster it gets. So twice the diameter is twice the, twice the surface speed. So usually uh, surface speeds um, in the books, especially all the books are referenced in inches per minute. Uh, it's like a run lens when you unwind all that uh, circle pass into a string. Um, and or millimeters, meters uh, per minute as well. Um, so usually uh, you have to recalculate your speed in, uh, into your diameter. So you basically um, multiply by pi, by pi uh, multiply by the uh, rotations per minute and you would get your surface speed. Um, roughly for larger diameters, it should be slower. Uh, for smaller diameters, it should be faster. Um, for different materials, um, it should be different as well. Um, but if you look at the book value, it's usually way above what you uh, would ever encounter in this machine. And the reason is that Mm, value in the book is designed to be uh, the manufacturing uh, value and your usual uh, tool life in the manufacturing is roughly between 15 minutes and an hour. You can prolong the tool life uh, way more if you go slower and what uh, pretty much everyone is doing in hobby shops. Unfortunately you cannot go as slow as possible because first it would stop uh, cutting things and second um, it would create a really really rough surface 
because the faster uh, you rotate the stock, the uh, denser the grooves you're creating in the material are, so it would be smoother. Um, roughly, as a guidance with aluminium stock, on this machine you can go as fast as you would, because your general machining speed in for aluminium is around uh, 2500 RPM and this machine goes only as, uh, as high as uh, 1200. Uh, for steel, um, I would recommend to start with lower values. Uh, if you're cutting steel, uh, start with 300-400 RPM. You can go faster if you do shallow cuts, um, which I'll talk about slightly later on. Um, but generally, you should go slower for steel. Also, uh, in terms of speeds, you should go slower uh, when you're parting uh, your um, part off. Mm, the general guidance for parting is the uh, you set the speed as roughly as 30% of turning. So if you were turning uh, steel at 400 RPM, you would part at 100, uh, maybe 150 RPM. Um, in order to set speeds on this machine, we have three levers, which can be, each of them can be in the left position or the right position. We have a rather cryptical table here explaining how it works. Basically, this lever goes vertical and left, this lever goes roughly vertical and right, and this lever goes either left or right. So the setup we have now is this lever is left, this lever is right, and this lever is on the right as well, and that would be 760. Uh, keep in mind that this square bit here is uh, the handle, which is round on the actual lever. And the round bit here is the pivot uh, relative to the lever. So if you look at that handle, that handle is drawn that way. Same goes for, for the top handles. So for example, we have the top levers here on the left. Uh, and the bottom lever here is on the right. So we are now at 315 RPM. And if we move the lever to the left, we would go to 500. Because uh, we are switching speeds here with the physical gears, uh, sometimes you cannot go fully left or fully right. And then you have to make sure that the chuck is turning. Uh, and all the gears are in place. Obviously do it with the uh, guard foot up. Cool. Doing well. In terms of fits, um, basically when you start machining, you try to do as uh, much shallow cuts as possible uh, because if you're doing shallow cuts you execute less tool pressure on the stock and you uh, get away with um, some of the machining mistakes as well uh, you have less chance of something getting loose or flying away um, but sometimes you won't just want the quick material removal I wouldn't recommend uh, to go more than one millimeter on uh, aluminium and maybe half a millimeter uh, on steel for a start for rough pass passes. Rough passes wouldn't be precise because you execute lots of pressure into the stock and it deflects. So you won't be able to get a precise surface out of that. If you need uh, shallow cuts, it should be roughly one maybe from one to five thou and yeah we'll have to talk about thou we're in a metric country uh one thou is basically one fortieth of the millimeter 2.5 uh, micrometers um, and you kind of have to deal with it because we have the uh 
handles here uh, they have uh, grates in so uh, but you can avoid it rather recalculating into uh, more convenient units for you uh, or using uh, dial indicators uh, fortunately this machine have a uh, no space for the ind dial indicator. You just preload the thing. Uh, make sure that uh, thing is loaded. You push it up. Uh, you zero it. And when you move your handle, you can set exact depth of cut uh, you want it to be. It's extremely important to keep that machine clean. Because every uh, metal chip that gets uh, there, it ends up uh, getting in the vase uh, between the precision uh, machine surfaces and it would abrade them and wear them. So keep it clear from the uh, dust, especially abrasive dust, angle grinder dust. We have a dedicated corner for angle grinders. And when you're done uh, doing uh, your stuff on the machine, please clean it up. It's very important. It would be less important for a bandsaw or a drill press. I wouldn't mind uh, the mess left around the metal shop, but for the precise machines, it's really, really, really important. Uh, the way you do it, you cannot um, smear the uh, hard metal dust on the waste. You clean the top of the waste with a brush you remove all the chips uh, down to the tray. Uh, don't ever try to uh, grab a paper towel and smear, smear it around, just uh, brush it off. Um, then you have to wait until uh, all the coolant soaks down into the uh, coolant tank. It usually takes a while. Um, you have around, because it's really viscous, you have around 15 minutes until it soaks fully out. Uh, then you remove the large chunks. Your large chunks you can grab uh, at the time when you can grab gloves, the only time you deal with the lace. Obviously before cleaning the machine, isolate it. Uh, grab the large chunks uh, with uh, paper towels, you put it to the bin. Uh, keep in mind that if you are machining in aluminium, you may get away with not cutting yourself. But if it's a steel swarp, you would definitely cut it yourself if you touch it. So be extra careful with it. When all the uh, big uh, chunks are out and the oil is fully drained, you uh, get a metal Henry over here and vacuum it up.